This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be chairing this um, Latin American History Seminar uh, with uh, Dr. Mark Thurner. Well, I'm sure most of you um, know him already, but I'll just briefly... Uh, Mark is currently a uh, reader in Latin American Studies at ILUS. He was previously at the University of Florida uh, in the History Department. And uh, he is the author of a number of studies on uh, the history of Peru uh, and um, post-colonial um, uh, history in, in Latin America. Uh, his first uh, study, ma major publication, was in '97 on um, post-colonial state formation in Peru, specifically in, in Huaraz. And then more recently, he published a study called Histories Peru, which looked at um, Peruvian historiography, um, the work of Basadre, Lorente, and others. Uh, and today he is talking on Unthinking the Canon, Latin America, and the History of Historiography. Thanks, Paolo. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, um, this project is uh, part of a book it's that I'm writing. Um, I'm calling it The Indias of History. And it's a, it's a wide-ranging um, reflection on... Um, the significance of the cronicas and their heirs uh, in historiography at large and how it allows us to intervene in um, the way in which the history of historiography has been written which is primarily the history of historiography it's, a, it's an interesting field um, it's primarily been written from the perspective of late 19th and early 20th century um, Northwestern European historiography, mainly German, English, and French. Um, and there's a series of books on the history of historiographies that are date from that period, and they, over time, come to compose a canon. Probably the most recent um, manifestation of this would be Donald Kelly's trilogy, which is now the, the textbook History of History um, text. Uh, published by Yale, and um, there are several sort of variations on that. And I've been teaching history of historiography at, at Florida for about I don't know, half a decade or so, and so um, this project came out of both that teaching experience and then my own research on the on the history of uh, cronicas and the way in which the cronicas get rewritten and inscribed in national historiographies of Latin America, particularly Mexico and Peru, other ones I've, I've worked on most, but also a little bit um, in um, Spain. Um, okay, so um, this talking about this literature, you have to sort of engage in some theory, although um, I'm trying to keep it as um, uh, sort of pedestrian as possible because it's very easy to for this to shade over into um, philosophy of being and um, the whole sort of Heideggerian tradition that the French have to write about history um, which I think is all very interesting but um, in the sort of history of history and history of theory of history literature there's, an, I think, a, a good um, sort of inclination to try to write about this in a way that engages the historical profession. And um, I think the historical profession, by and large, is um, built in such a way that it tends to be allergic to theorizing about itself. And that's typical of every discipline. I don't think it's particularly, it's not particularly, um, you know, like history is bad because of that. Any discipline generally um, likes to assume a lot of things about itself in order to sort of go forward. 
um, history of history tends to undermine all of those things. And in a lot of ways, you just end up spinning your wheels. Um, you think back, maybe the, the impact of meta history, uh, Hayden White's book, um, now very old uh, on the profession, um, it, it sort of made a big noise and then was sort of shelved, I think you might say, in, in terms of where the profession went. Although as a result of that, um, Hayden White became actually much more important, for example, in literary studies, right, and philosophy of language, where there's a big production around his work, much less so in history. The, the big exception to this is the historians who contribute to history and theory, right? This is a journal based in, in Wellesley and, and then sort of tributaries of that. I've, I've been involved in that journal and actually the second, this, what I'm going to talk about today is, is coming out um, next month in history and theory. Um, history and theory in turn has given rise to the um, INTH, which is the um, International Network for Theory of History, which was born two years ago. And the first um, meeting was in Ghent. And um, I was at that meeting. We had, a, we had a meeting on Latin American historiography. Some of the papers in that came out in Storia de la Historiografía in July. Um, at my piece in that um, special issue of Storia um, directly engages Francois Hartog's uh, keynote address to the, um, to the Congress, which is very well uh, you know, attended conference, people from all over, the predominantly European. And um, he, he, he sort of gives a, a kind of an end of history uh, wake-up call to historians saying that the concept of memory is displacing the concept of history. And in part, this is because history has become synonymous with Europe uh, in the sense of Europe being the tribunal of history. And, and he traces that to the 19th century and says that that kind of history that is Europe as tribunal, history in a capital H, is, is no longer viable um, and is being displaced by memory as a sort of a, the key concept. Now, he's not happy with that and he develops a critique of that and he says that what we need to do, um, he's, he's speaking to this Congress, is to find ways to um, sort of recast history in some other kind of role than tribunal, and particularly associated with Europe. And so I, I try, I make a stab at that invitation, and I met with Francois over coffee in Paris and talked about how we might, or how I might do this. And, um, and so, so that was the piece that came out in Storia. Um, basically what I argue there is that uh, it, it, actually, his piece is, he's talking about the word history as well. And in France, there's a big tradition about you know, speaking about, you know, what does the word mean? Uh, where does it come from? I engaged Historia in its sort of genealogy in uh, Hispanic American historical discourse. And um, I, I, I basically argue that um, we could it's possible to think about the modern concept of history as having a global colonial genealogy before it becomes associated with Europe as tribunal. If, um, and Hartog agrees with this, if we see that as being a late 18th and sort of to mid 19th century invention, that is, it's in that period in which Europe as tribunal of history is becomes a concept and a consolidated idea, which then begins to reverberate in the historiography. And so I was saying, well, what if we think about history in the capital H as being something prior to Europe as tribunal of history? And what if we trace it um, 
in the colonial world, in, in what was called Indias, right? Uh, and so I, I, I take a stab at that, and um, I suggest that th there's enough material here to, to begin to think about a colonial genealogy of modern history, and that that has certain advantages for recovering a concept of history which was, if you want, pre-European in this particular sense that Hartog is talking about, um, and which could then give us something to um, go back to that wasn't, uh, again, this kind of historicist European tribunal. The, the, this is the same tribunal which Tepes Trakabardi is complaining about in provincializing Europe, right? The one which delivers history to the west of the world as a colonial gift and saying, you can be like us, right? If you, if you get your history right. Um, so, so in other words, sort of shift the, the, if you want, the origins of modern historical discourse to the colonies and then and see what we could do with that. Um, and uh, knowing Peru best, um, I draw on the Peruvian material more than the Mexican material. Um, there's also some strong reasons for doing that, even now that I've read more of the Mexican material. I'm, I'm sort of convinced that Peru is sort of ahead of Mexico. And it, we always think of Mexico as being sort of ahead of Peru in many ways. But when I think in historical discourse, um, interestingly, Peru is, and it's, it's, and it's in part because of um, the interest in Peru as a, particularly the Incas, right, as, as this kind of historical talisman almost. And the Aztecs don't hold that fascination. Um, also because um, there's um, a sort of a, um, there's no Inca Garcilaso. <laughs> First of all, for Mexico, there's Sagún, and and then there are um, indigenous writers, and we have indigenous writers on the on the Peruvian side. But um, and and then we, we we see that pattern also in the late in the 18th century and the 19th century historical writing, um, where if you look at the Mexicans and the Peruvians, um, which I, which I'm doing in this book, you generally see that the Peruvians are. This might be my Peruvianist bias, but I have presented this in Mexico, and uh, you know I wasn't uh, driven out of town. Uh, uh, you know this 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 kind of notion that um, at least in this maybe Mexico is not the first America, as Brading says. Um, and the other, there's also a critique of braiding. I think the book, The First America, really doesn't do very good justice to Peru. It sort of look, makes it look derivative. And uh, Mexico is sort of, uh, my book is going to sort of reverse that. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting off here. Um, that's sort of how I came to this. And that this is the, the, the latest sort of iteration of it in these articles. Um, I, I then bring it down and, and, I, and I look and I say, you know, what is the, um, you know, so the first point is, okay, we could, we could give a sort of a colonial genealogy to the birth of modern global history, historiography, okay. That, I think it's viable. I'm not saying that you couldn't do it another way or that, or that this is the, you know, the whole and only truth, but that it, it is, there is a, a way to do it. And I think it's defensible in this arena of history of history. Hopefully it is. Otherwise, nobody will read my book. Um, but from enough discussions I've had, I, I think enough people will at least entertain this possibility. Then the next thing is, um, what about uh, the Enlightenment, right? What about historical writing in the 18th century? Um, and here I, I enter into dialogue with Jorge Canizares and some others on um, is, can we think about 18th century um, 
historical writing um, uh, in the Americas um, as um, you know, I don't know, we don't have to call it an enlightenment. We could, in fact, even call it a counter-enlightenment in the way that Isaiah Berlin does, I think. Um, although I, I really don't like so much either of those terms um, because, in fact, those terms are invented later uh, and then projected back. Um, for example, in, 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 uh, in English, um, the enlightenment doesn't become a term to refer to a period until about the middle of the 19th century. And it's basically, it's borrowed from the German Aufklärung. So it really doesn't have, uh, if you want a native genealogy in English discourse. In Spanish discourse, however, Ilustración does, and it's actually quite early. Um, as early easily as the French. Um, there's a kind of a genealogy there of concepts which we've sort of barely begun to look at. Um, it's quite possible that, um, or at least I'm, I'm entertaining this, that um, a kind of, a, 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 if you want, an enlightened historicism, historia ilustrada is often the term being used, um, and also historia critica is the other term that's frequently used, critical history, is becoming a widely shared concept in uh, in the Americas, in Mexico, in Peru, in Spain, um, it, also in France, um, from the early 18th century. And uh, basically what it means is sort of critically reading sources um, and um, using oral testimony, archaeology, um, you know, a whole range of sources, which is sort of breaking open the, the historical field, right, as, as kind of stories talks about, into a whole set of sources of, or, or kinds of evidence. Um, and my argument is that this kind of evidence is really um, needed. It's the main kind of evidence available in the Americas. There's a kind of a there's a sort of a reason for um, a kind of an enlightened historicism emerging, I think, as early as any place else. That's sort of where I'm, what I'm saying now. In the early 18th century, um, in the Americas, it, 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 part of it is driven by the lack of written pre-colonial sources. Um, the preponderance of collecting and the reconnaissance of archaeological sites. Um, and of course that, that has a long tradition which goes back to the early uh, middle 16th century. And a, a very strong natural history tradition, also quite old, which combines um, observation with uh, the um, uh, sort of transcription of classical texts um, that is from the classical tradition, um, right, which are being uh, translated into Spanish and so on. So that there, there's a way to think about a kind of um, enlightened historicist tradition emerging out of its own sort of sources and limitations um, without needing to say that it was imported from Europe. Um, and so I, I talk about what would be the, what is the consequence of that for thinking about the history of history? That is, if we could at least entertain the possibility that not only modern history per se, but I think enlightened historicism, which is sort of at the origins of the discipline, could also have a colonial origin. Um, okay, then I, I, I take that and I go into the question of, you know, national history. Um, where was national history born? Uh, there's, a, there's a long tradition which argues for Europe. Right, Europe 
national history is a European invention. Some will say it, it's, a, it's a sort of a reworking of medieval traditions. Um, that, that's sort of what Kelly argues. Um, the Romantics get a hold of that and, and then they turn it into national traditions. Archaeology becomes important in that sense. You know, we get Stonehenge and so on. We get France now claiming Clovis as a founder and so on, right? That is this, this sort of tradition, um, which would sort of be, is consolidated by certainly uh, the 1840s, 1850s, right? In continental Europe and, and, uh, and uh, Great Britain. Lord Acton and so on. Um, if you take the arguments that are used for that sort of scenario and you apply them to the Americas, I say you could make the same argument and actually point to earlier origins. Um, obviously, you can't go to medieval because, but you, what, you, what you can do is you can look at um, particularly the early colonial tradition, again in, in Peru. Um, even before Inca Garcilaso, but certainly in Inca Garcilaso, of writing history from a Peruvian we, which goes back to the, um, as far back as you can go in oral tradition, to write a genealogy of the nation. Um, and this tradition is, in fact, reworked in the 19th century, right? It becomes the basis for a Peruvian national narrative and lives into the 20th century and so on. You can do similar thing for Mexico. So um, again, the, the argument I suggest is that it would be, it's possible to think about national history as also being, uh, if you want, uh, the term I'm using here is a colonial invention. That is, um, if you compare it and using the same sort of criteria used to make these arguments for Europe, you can make these arguments there and you can do it more or less the same period, even earlier if you want. Um, and it all seems to be arguable. It can be done in according to the rules of evidence and textuality and so on. I think that are broadly accepted in the discipline. Okay, then, uh, then I go forward and I talk about, um, I ask the question, um, where was historicism born? And we know that Hartog and Chakrabarty would say, well, basically 19th century Europe and the key text would be Meineke, you know, and, and some of these others, which are written during the crisis of historicism in the interwar years, right? This is really the moment in which historicism is retrospectively uh, enshrined, if you will, as a European tradition. And it's mainly because of the German crisis, the loss of the Great War, a great identity crisis in Germany, the whole German tradition traced back to Goethe, um, right, coming forward to Ranka is now in serious doubt, right? Was this all a huge imperial mistake? Uh, and the French are saying yes. <laughs> And the Germans are defending that tradition. And so in, in part, in large part, the German defense of their own historical tradition vis-a-vis -vis the French is what enshrines historicism uh, as a, um, you know, recognizable entity associated both with the birth of the discipline, right? Ranke as being the father of the discipline, but also with the birth of the philosophy of history, right? Because you can bring into, into historicism Herder, Hegel, Marx, right? I mean, you know, a big lineup of, um, of all of our heroes. And so uh, this is a very powerful narrative. Uh, I, I um, entertain the possibility that one could think about a historicist tradition in the Americas. What would it look like? If we did something like Meineke did, um, don't exactly do what Meineke did. I sort of critique what he did and suggest that, um, uh, you know, sort of the, the problems with that as being part of the problem why historicism is the target of postcolonial critique, right? Uh, particularly Chakrabarty is the sort of the, 
the emblematic book, right, argues that um, historicism is a, a sort of a colonizing developmentalist discourse which um, puts um, Europe first and everybody else is basically on, on catching up um, through a process of historical development with Europe. Um, colonialism is therefore important indirectly or directly until sufficient degree of historicist developments achieved at which time the sovereign subject of history takes care of things, right? becomes independent and an actor on the world stage of history. Um, a, that kind of narrative just does not work at all for Peru or a place like Mexico. Um, history was never sort of received in that fashion in those places. When you look at the historians, the historians are think that they have a much deeper tradition. Um, and I, I think I show that um, historicist thinkers in Europe and historicist thinkers in America is, are drawing on the same earlier sources. And I think broadly speaking, and I think Meineke is right, broadly speaking, it's a neo-Platonist tradition. Now, the neo-Platonist tradition is, you know, it's, it's, it's an octopus, you know, it's Arabic, it's Mediterranean, it has, um, you find it even in the Far East, right? Um, it certainly gets to the Americas very early. There is a number of sort of key sort of historical concepts that are, um, that have both Old Testament and Greco-Roman origins. Um, and with some others obviously mixed in because those were not isolated traditions either, right? They brought in oral traditions and so on. Um, so that, um, I mean, there would be this some kind of a substrata of set of, say, historical ideas or concepts that would that are then sort of floating around and then are reworked in different parts of the world to become historicist traditions. That's sort of the broader thing I'm arguing. That That's the sort of India's of history concept, the concept that um, it, history is sort of all over the place as a, as a possibility and it can be it can be developed but it's not recognized in history's genealogy of itself as such because if it was then basically the whole sort of discourse of western history would would um, crumble um Okay, and, and so then finally I, I argue that um, you can also see a crisis of historicism in, uh, in the Americas. Um, right, and it's, you know, one, one of the good things about Kelly's book, which I think has a lot of problems, it's sort of a, it's sort of a you know, big man, History of History, which is basically how it's taught, and, there's, and these are great books, and these are great men, and nothing, nothing uh, necessarily, um, I mean, it's useful. Um, it, it doesn't really help for what I'm doing, because what I'm trying to do is identify concepts and um, discourses that sort of travel around and then get changed, uh, rather than particular figures, right? more in line with what we do today in, say, conceptual history, history of history. But um, one of the things he does do again and again in the historical tradition that he's talking about, which is basically Western, and basically goes from from Greece to, um, you know, to, to Germany and, and from there to, to the UK and maybe the United States, is um, that war um, is... Uh, it's always been sort of a central um, historical concept, war. You know, war is a, things happen, it's an intervention in time, we, it's used to periodize, dy dynasties come and go, what marks dynasties is warfare and so on. And we can do this outside of the Western tradition, we can go to China, we can go to India, we could go to, we could go to, to Yucatec, Yucatec Maya, we could go, 
that is war is a marker of time and that histories are generally written sort of after wars and, and, and sort of you, you might think of it as being sort of the origins of periodization or something um, or, or that, that there are sort of elements of that in there and so uh, when we look at um, say Latin American history uh, there are wars and uh, key conflicts particular moments in which history then gets rewritten and a period is marked obviously independence conquest right are, are these bong bong right in in the way Latin American history is, is written but then, then there are other conflicts and um Clearly for Peru, the War of the Pacific uh, the, uh, is, is one. Uh, um, uh, the um, the um, War of Succession, which which you know changes the dynasty from from the Austrias to the uh, Um These are moments which in which the historiography shifts take account of this and present a new future, relook at that previous period in order to see how, what, what are the elements that lead to what we are now. And um, looking at that, I think I, I, I've, I've been able to, to, to provide at least a way of thinking about some alternative periodization that wouldn't, wouldn't be necessarily, you know, ancient, you know, enlightenment, modern, you know, Medieval, you know, basically the European package, right? And, and putting it on some other place. Um, so, so for example, if you think like the crisis of historicism in Europe is set off by the um, catastrophe of the Great War, right? And you could say that, well, that was the crisis of the Hegelian spectacle of progress, or you could put it in a lot of many other ways. Um, you know, um, in 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 uh, in the Americas, in some ways, um, independence functioned in that fashion. Uh, not not. I mean, it also in it functioned in some of the fashion in which the French Revolution functions, right? Um, in terms of okay, we now have the death of the king, and um, therefore the history of dynasties is over and now we're going to we're going to write the history of people right but independence also meant um, it wasn't just you know cutting off the head of the aristocracy replacing the king it was about sort of establishing a whole new um, sort of social and cultural order which meant um, you know sort of exercising um, a colonial past and a colonial history. It's a bit different than what happens in Europe. And this gets manifested in the historiography. Uh, it also happens in Peru, for example, in the War of the Pacific. Um, the more I think about it, I think the War of the Pacific is the... And we have all this talk about the long 19th century, but if you think about historiography, I think the War of the Pacific is the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. We're talking 1879, 1883. Um, because that crisis is so profound for Peru and for Peruvian historians that they have to rethink everything that was written by the 19th century historians. Um, and it takes a while for this to gestate because um, of the catastrophe really for Peru and it finally gets a new generation of historians um, in the early 20th century after Carlos Vice, then Riva Aguero, uh, a little bit later Basadre. Um, and they write a whole new history which actually very much incarnates this crisis of historicism which, which happens in in a place like Germany, which is sort of pulverized like Peru was by Chile, but quite a bit later. Um, and so I, at least I found a little bit of room there to argue that in terms of a, a crisis of historicism, and historicism in this case is, is, is um, embodied in the figure of Sebastián Lorente in the 19th century, means that essentially Lorente will be um, 
shelved. And a new historical discourse is going to be invented on the ashes of the War of the Pacific. That's eventually going to reconstitute a, a new kind of historicism. But in, in particularly in these years um, after the war, I think there's a lot of elements that we also find in interwar, uh, say, German historical discourse. Um, I, I just give that as an example of some of the way I'm thinking about this in terms of how to um, be able to talk about these shifts in a historical discourse without doing the obligatory, oh, you know, uh, Basadre read, uh, you know, Ortega Gasset. Ortega Gasset read Heidegger, and, right? Which is generally how the story is told, right? But that's how it's told. You can go in the intellectual history textbooks, the history of historiography, and that's how they'll tell it to you, as if text just traveled, you know, without any. Um, sort of blood on their fingers, you know, uh, or, or could be easily translated or, or read, right? Um, received. Basadri did read those things, but they, they were more like ammunition for what he was thinking about and the sources he was encountering and his own, and his own struggle to develop his own historicist philosophy that was Peruvian. You know, not to read those people would have been, um, you know, uh, impermissible for a for a res for respecting uh, self-respecting historian. And it, you know, the, the same Garcilaso would, um, you know, had his Herodotus and um, Tacitus and. Uh, his his classical Spanish historians and and was 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 sufficiently versed in in those things to um, know that he had something different, right? Because otherwise you can't know it, right? I mean, otherwise you can't engage it. How am I doing for time? Um, a little bit more time, if you want. A little bit more. Okay. Um, so the, the in the, in the in the blurb I put out there, I, I said I was talking about the canon and or unthinking the canon, and so uh, the but what I meant by that is um, not only sort of the you know the the lineup that we're given in history of history. But the the history that underlies it and its per, its periodical structure, um, which sort of gives it meaning uh, and makes it obligatory for us to read. Uh, and so I, I try to identify what those things precisely are, and you know why is it necessary to read Herodotus. I don't, how many of you have read Herodotus? Maybe it's not necessary anymore. Yeah, maybe it's becoming less necessary. It was necessary for my people, right? Um, you know, um, it was, but it was also necessary to read Inca Garcilaso. Why? I think it's similar um, it, because he was the father of history and the father of lies. Uh, and here, I Hartog's reading, I think, of, of Herodotus is, is very useful. That is, what Herodotus um, is the impossible father because you can't be the father of history if history didn't yet exist, right? Um, so he is both the father and the son. And Garcilaso is really the same. Uh, he, he is the son of his own text, you might say. And that text becomes Peruvian history. And that text opens up a future for Peruvian histories to inscribe themselves in as Peruvian histories, writing Peruvian history. And that's, so that sounds a little complicated. It's really not when you just break it down into text and you look 
you know, who's citing who and why and why it's important that he be there. Um, so that you can see a canonical structure to Peruvian historical discourse. It gets um, severely criticized and, and to the point where now it's, I think it's very precarious because in many ways uh, historical discourse today has become uh, anti-historical. And in this, in this sense, I sort of agree with uh, Hartog that is, um, since all that stuff is sort of bad or wrong, you know, we just don't read it anymore. We don't have time, by the way. I just have to read all these people around me, right? And so history becomes the sort of the current production, right? The current field of production, right? Which is assigned meaning by the politics of citation and so on, and degree granting and programs, right, for professional historians. But meanwhile, you go outside of that and you, and, you, and you talk to someone who's sort of generally educated in reading proving history and they're reading that canon. They know about it, you know. Um, and it's because there are some histories that are being written which still invoke their thought if not actually citing them, right? That is, their thought still exists sedimented in a more popular historical discourse. And this, this certainly has happened with Basadre. Basadre is both everywhere in the popular imagination and also in the scholarly imagination. He's, in that sense, he's sort of like Garcia so He was able to be both of those at the same time. My point here is that, um, uh, or, or what I'm trying to do is, is look exactly what contributes to canon formation and then sort of show how this can happen in different ways and then make an argument for how um, the sort of the canon of global historiography and I think we cannot avoid it because I think historical discourse um, inevitably has a canon even in an anti-canonical historical discourse that is it can't be avoided because um, the sedimentation of those concepts is there unacknowledged right in the contemporary field of discourse and Donald Kelly's book I think is brilliant at that really I mean I, you know, this is a book that it, it's a trilogy actually and then there's actually then then, then there's the um, also the readers that go with it which I recommend as a general education in sort of the history of historiography um, a fast one um, is, is, is he's always pointing out how our, our contemporary historical discourse is, in, you know, just this stuff is all over the place in it, unacknowledged, right? And so he's trying to get us at least to recognize our own ignorance, right? which I think is probably the, the best vocation for history, right? Um, that is to, to constantly remind us of our present ignorance. Um, that's humbling, and that and that and that creates a, a a field of doubt, right? Of doubtfulness, which I think is at, at the heart of what historical discourse is. Um, but it's a it's a sort of a a series of doubts that has to have some um, hermeneutics of faith, right? If you want a sort of a fancy term, as Dilthey would say, that is there has to be some kind of a investment in the notion that the whole tradition actually is worthwhile. That, that is, it grants us some kind of wisdom that we wouldn't otherwise have. Okay. Um, and I think that is part of the historical tradition, right? It's not shared by a lot of the social sciences, right? We'll just, just as well do without it, right? But I think it's part of the historical sensitivity, and I think you can find it in really all historical traditions. I think I'll end on that. Okay, thank you.